Hey, and welcome to TSOB. This is a podcast for entrepreneurs who are interested in investing or starting their own funds. We are Adam Anderson and Zach Eikenberry. Join us to get a behind the scenes look at the relationships between founding entrepreneurs and the VCs that invest in them. Hello, Adam. Come on. You were just talking about your technology issues previous to hitting record. And I was going to make the point that um, I don't think it's a, a spiritual thing, but hook security often feels inevitable. Like there's things outside of our control that fall into mm-hmm. place and in our favor at the right time and the right way. And there's been three distinct VC calls, not customer calls, not internal team calls, et cetera. Three distinct VC calls where my technology has failed me in the last six weeks. And it's frustrated me that I've been unable to, you know, get the volume to to work on my computer, to be able to yep. share yep. the screen, to yep. Zoom crashing in the middle of it. Mm. And um, that just might be the universe uh, trying to tell me something. And um, like I said, I, 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 I find it fascinating. It's only in those type of calls that my technology will fail me. I hope it's not trying to tell you something because I'm trying to get, you know, DocuSign to send out some SPV. I need the only thing standing between $1.5 million being wired today is my inability to get a goddamn DocuSign form to work. It's like, that's it. It's just being like, can I can I make the form so they can put their name in and then it auto populates and make it easy for the limited uh, partners? So uh, shall we make this the shortest podcast ever and you go do that? No, nah, fuck them. I figured it out. I'm just going to add the fields to the actual document and they're going to have to type their name in when they are filling in their signatures. Oh so I'm going to bypass all the DocuSign. Look how much I can help you. And you should pay me an extra uh, $25 a month for this thing. That's so complicated. No one can use. Uh, nah, so- I'm just going to add another line on my signature page where they actually type their name in. So, you know, DocuSign, um, one of the things that they realized in their journey, and this is Jason Limkin because he was DocuSign, mm-hmm. uh, is you can't actually get the value you want out of digital signatures from the smaller mid-sized business, right? You can only spend money where people are just not spending their own budget, right? So mm-hmm. um, the way that you got DocuSign is they got into the enterprise and said, it's not coming out of your budget and we'll make your life easier. So use our tool. And I think that's fascinating because you're a use case where you're like, it's not worth me spending the money on. Why the hell does this thing exist? This is very frustrating. But if you weren't spending your own money and your own time, you'd be like DocuSign. That gives me everything I need to manage this from the enterprise. And you would roll that out. And you could care less what the user cares about because that's what Adobe does. They build stuff for the enterprise. And I just think that that's... uh, it's a very fascinating case to realize that your SaaS tool is not made for the value-driven buyer. Yeah, I just, there you go. That's my that's my riff. That made me feel so much better about <laughs> not sending out my okay. docu. That no, hey, thanks, <laughs> thanks, man. That was like everything. Yeah. So from the audience, uh, we're at this next seed, we're going to need, I tried to yes and you, and uh, that's not working this morning, is it? Yeah, well, well, don't, don't yes and a thing. You know, like, you know uh, uh, I'm real sad today and I'm angry about a thing. Oh, yeah? Well, let me tell you why that's appropriate. <laughs> I, I'm going to, uh, not only am I going to validate your emotions, I'm going to make you think deeper. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, you know what? Fuck Lincoln. I at this point, I'm gonna go to Panda Docs. I know what the hell to do with it. That's right. So right. you know, well, yeah, you just lost sixty five dollars a month, Limkin. <laughs> ha! But then on the, I don't think he cares. Yeah, he never wanted your sixty five dollars a month. That's the point. Oh, is that the is that the answer? Anyway, it's been a it's been a roller coaster since we've recorded our last one of these. Mm-hmm. I think it's something like a. 
and we were just entering the um a season where we were winning pitch competitions and we're setting ourselves up and it culminated with uh, being in Atlanta and speed dating and networking. And, you know, the punchline has been that we've had an awful, awful lot of conversations and we've learned an awful lot. And I thought, hey, why don't we go ahead and process that today? Because I think I'm still emotionally raw from the whole thing. And it's just getting more and more sphincter tightening, um, hmm. which is interesting because the reason that I feel a sense of distress or a sense of angst has nothing to do with the actual quality of our company and has everything to do with the external hmm. Venture yes. experience. So, I had a call. I, I sat down with um, Brad today at, at uh, for, uh, for a breakfast coffee, and he's like, "We had our best month ever. We had a six figure month in sales. We had the most leads. I mean, everything is working. Why don't I feel happy?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah." Because tactically yeah. versus the strategic. So yeah, I wanted to riff well, on that it's, today. It's, it is. Um, it's. It might actually be like narrative mindset, not even strat strategy or tactic that is mm -hmm. um that's at play here. Because uh I've also I so I've been evaluating some of my thinking in a few different ways. We we can parse that out today. Um on you know what does it mean to be a VC and where does their yes, what do they bring to the table and what do they not, and mm. where are they? in their own self-awareness, social, emotional journey, right? As a VC, as an industry and VCs that I've interacted with anecdotally. But the, um, on a personal level, which I reflect, I find that um, anger, frustration, sadness, and the like come from the difference between what your expectations are and what reality is. Mm -hmm. And so what happened previously when a, uh, I was building schools is I used to tell people all the time, our ambitions outpaced our budget all, all the time. We knew exactly what we ought to be doing. Yeah. And then there's what we could do. And it's very frustrating because personally, I do not use the word can't. Can't is a red flag for me. And I, it really bothers me when people I love use the word can't. I think there are always substitutes for that word. Mm -hmm. And, um, when we're coming into like October and Q4, I've started to notice that our mindset had this set of expectations and reality was better than what other people expected out of us, but our internal expectations were here. And it had to do with the idea that like we were going to uh, raise enough capital to do some really cool things that matched our ambitions. It had to do with um, having a team and, you know, having sales leadership and other people in the pipeline for building out and doubling the size of our company and on and on and on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I told the team today on, uh, on our huddle that, um, I, I own that, that we, we, we should be celebrating and high-fiving and I let a number of NBAs who have never run a business before in their life uh, dictate what my mindset was and how I should feel about my company. Mm -hmm. And that was inappropriate and wrong. And I asked their forgiveness on the huddle. And I told That's them, well we're played. crushing it. Well played. So, yeah. yeah. Isn't it suck that you can get on stage and win a thing and then feel good. And then you get on another stage and don't win a thing and then feel bad. And I'm like, yeah. how dare you have any impact on my well being based off? And then you're like, oh, I gave you permission to do that. Yeah, and these VCs, they're they're giving me their garbage, right? Like they don't think well of themselves. I'm looking at VC marks and portfolio development and the things that these guys are betting on. Like I can tell you right now, if I could take a short or a put against all these VC portfolios, that's where the money is. Like I, I went back and dug into a VC that passed on us on Monday, and I was like. Cause I had put them on a pedestal and I wanted them to like this. What we can get it. I wanted them to like me and I wanted to be part of their crew and their tribe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I had, I went in and I did everything they asked me to do to prep. And at the end of the day, 
they just weren't sold because they don't uh, quite understand a lot of things. And that's my fault that they didn't understand it. But my mindset was, man, I really want to be part of this tribe. And then I looked at a couple of their businesses. And then I looked at a couple of their recent exits. And they're not doing hot. Their anxiety when they show up in that room trying to pick the next, you know, uh, whatever unicorn is through the roof. Yeah. And they don't know what their own bar of excellence is. That's interesting. They don't because if I was a VC right now, I'd be shitting myself because all these VCs, all they know to do is yell at their current portfolio to like decrease burn, get through the winter, find an exit, find an exit. Like, but they're, they're taking awful marks. Mm -hmm. And this VC that I saw on Monday, when I went back and looked at them with clear eyes, I was like, if they pick me, that would be a scarlet letter. Like these wow. guys aren't picking good marks. Like, like I'm looking at it like differently now. And I'm like, Oh, what they're bringing to me is anxiety. Like we really need to get some sort of crazy winner in a space that we know a lot about. And they're, they can't evaluate us based upon the, the facts. Right. Right. Well, and then they, they ask the most asinine questions and, and not to get into it, but the, the fact that I love the guys who say, I don't know the space. We had a conversation with um, another VC that um, was real clear. It's like, you guys aren't in my space. You know, we'll look at it, but that was being polite. He's, he's, I don't want to waste his time or my time. I don't understand your industry. You're, you're not in my space. Sure. The interesting thing that we have is when we talk SAS. SAS is too broad of a term, Right. They, you know, oh, I'm a tech investor. I'm a SaaS investor. I want to flee so fast from anyone who says that, because that just means that you like that recurring revenue model and you think that tech can have a big exit. And I'm like, but if you don't understand the the nuances of the cybersecurity, well, this is what we learned. What we learned was um, in in the crucible that was speed dating venture funds and and fund managers. You came up with the, how do I tell the story better? Which was, we compete for the first three years, we lead for the next three years, and we disrupt for the last three years. And now we're uh, we're a $10 billion company. And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, totally makes sense. The problem is, is that when you try to share that vision and the steps, they get to disrupt. And I, and someone told you, I just couldn't picture what the future was. So we couldn't go with you. <laughs> Why are you in venture? Go do private equity. If you could or, vision what we're doing, then we're not visionaries. Or, yeah. And like this, this idea that you de-risk it by like, maybe you do at that. Um, let me put it this way more and more. I believe that uh, venture capital needs, there needs to be new terminology for the people who invest at like 10 million. Yes. Well, because 10 million ARR and above, which we'll call B, C, and D, they're, they still see themselves as adventurous betters in the space, but um, there's got to be oh. a different term because they're not private equity, but they're also. Well, I think they call it growth capital. I think they call it yeah, venture, venture growth or growth something equity like that. folks. Yeah, yeah they, they are, but there's still people who call themselves venture, you know, like, Oh, VC firm is, you know, Andreessen Horowitz is leading our C round. And you're like, okay. Like, and so maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I'm overstating uh, it. No, I don't think you're wrong, but, but I am, I am beginning to, I feel like I, I, I want to check my own beliefs. I am also looking at, writing checks to people, right? We're, we're still get, trying to get that fund rolled up. Um, we're, the, the money we're getting wired today is going to go towards um, private equity growth, right? And the interesting thing is that I know we, we saw one e-com company that we were going to invest in and buy. We we're going to buy a big chunk of them. And they were awesome. But then a, another one came along that had three times better numbers. And we decided to go with the, uh, buy that one instead. And the, the 
we it's almost like we left the other company at the altar. We were getting so close, but then the the other deal came along, and it turned out it you know hey this is this is the one that you know the the partners wanted to bet on. Mm-hmm. And the message to them was hey uh, we love you guys, but a deal came along with bigger numbers, and we need to write bigger checks. Uh, rather than doing a whole bunch of small ones. And so you know, I, I really want to make sure that as we develop ourselves as capital allocators, what are the behaviors that we are observing today that we wish we would not, that we don't want to be able to, uh, we don't want to inflict those same behaviors on other people. That That's right. Um, but yes, so that's right. And if that is the case, like, the more you can preempt the founders that come to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's a different, if, if what, for example, the VCs that we were talking to on Monday, they have a fresh fund and it's about, if you cross some sort of absolute threshold, we'd like to invest. Now, if you're a relative VC fund, you're like, everybody's going to compete and we're only going to invest in the best, then you tell people that like hey we're Mm -hmm. a fund uh it's a competitive process here we're looking to invest in the best of the best when it comes to ecom Mm -hmm. and um people go oh okay and they're like what's that mean and they're like um it's we're not looking for you to meet some sort of threshold in us to believe and to invest we're looking at um in a certain period of time what is the best opportunity for us and we place our bet there and and Founders can go, okay, right? If yeah. that's how you want to deploy. But the thing you're saying is that you're actually telling the founders how the game is played. So it doesn't actually matter as long as you have full transparency. This is how the game is played. Um, the, the thing that I am beginning to find frustrating is when you ob- your, your thesis says we do 2 million ARR. And now you say you're a million ARR. We'll still talk to you. And then we'll waste all of your time and we'll get it to the end of the day. And some GP um, will say, well, they're not at 2 million. So we're out. And, oh, well, that that's three weeks of really, really hard work down the tubes where we yeah. shouldn't have done it to begin with. That's right. Is it a scarcity mindset? We don't think there's enough VCs out there. So we just take the call. Mm, no, I, I knew from the beginning for us personally, we were using a number of them to like try out messaging on. No, that's good. Um, the issue was there was a couple of the top tier folks that I wanted who emerged earlier than the in the practice rounds. Well, you have a mentor who directed you to a couple of, you know, where where he's invested in their funds and certain things like that. And I think mm-hmm. it's when uh, when a mentor says, Hey, I'm going to help you out and I'm going to get you the introductions. And then you don't cross the finish line. It's almost difficult to look back at that mentor and be like, eee, well, it's either you or me. Either you gave me somebody who was inappropriate and not the right fit, or I didn't deliver in some form or fashion. So I think that also has a little bit to do with the emotional states mm-hmm. uh, for, for these guys. But I do think you're right. Every single time that you have pitched, you've gotten better at it. The messaging is getting tighter. That's fair. Um, what's interesting right now is to know to know your company upside or right side upside down and your industry and everything. Like um, not only is being an entrepreneur, you have to do twenty things right every day, but you have to know all twenty of those things better than any capitalist mm-hmm. that comes along, any investor, mm-hmm. capital allocator, and. Right. I would say my maturity is I, I know um, my company and I know the numbers and I know a pro forma, what have you. And right. I, I have 19 out of 20 things. That 20th X factor is what I've been evaluating in my mind. And this is one of those things that I'm speculating on, which is um, what does it mean to be a fighter? So like for us uh, at Hook, Right, we have two people we're competing against. We're competing against cyber criminals, and we're competing against other people who sell snake oil in our industry. Yeah. Right. And so the world is being manipulated by two groups of people. 
and we show up and say the emperor has no clothes. Mm -hmm. And which I find fascinating. Somebody told me this morning, because I was talking about, you know, these VCs want to know that you're a fighter and you're going to win because you're, 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 you move from, can you outrun everybody in a race to, can you punch people in the face? Yes. And, um, the when i was talking to him he's like well then yeah you got to be like an uber who fought taxi unions and regulators every step of the way and the reason uber became who it did is because their ceo was a fighter and when people looked at him they said oh this is the only guy in the world that could take down both of them right and so i'm in a in a in an interesting spot in my own head about leveling up to represent and make sure that the fighting part of me is easily accessible to the VC and they can see it and they can understand it. And they, they know that I'm serious about ending cybercrime and ransomware on children's hospitals, human trafficking, young people caught up in cybercrime syndicates, scam artists in India. Like I am serious about taking on all of them. And I'm serious about taking on cults who lead competitors of ours. I'm serious about mm -hmm. um, these, the companies, these private equity groups that come in and buy companies in our industry and try to keep everybody else scared by claiming they're going to invest a certain amount of innovation in R&D. Yep. Like, like, I'm serious that a billion dollars will not stop us. I like a billion real dollar spend will not stop us from being a better company than that company. Well, if you, and if so, you dump money into a dumpster fire, the fire gets bigger. Sure. Or, yeah, but, but yeah, but that's what that's what's not accessible right now to the VCs. When I talk about that nineteen out of twenty, like, what are some of these th blind spots I have that so, I can one up? I I want to pivot and maybe talk about something kind of controversial. Um, if the leader in your market stands for a certain thing and is backed by a certain thing it is a potential fundraising strategy to find investors who desperately hate the thing that the leader is it's kind of like yeah. saying do you hate facebook well i'm going to start a new social media platform and it's for everybody who hates facebook yeah the, the problem is how far that takes you and if it sticks as part of your identity right like yeah. So, ooh. right. Like, I don't want to be the company that's always the alternative to, right. Mm -hmm. That's not my North star. And, and so I like, I'm okay with certain investors kind of coming together and deciding that for their set of righteous beliefs, that we are a, a better alternative. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to how we identify ourselves, um, I'm very cautious with alternative to. Uh, language so you, can you take money from a source and not have that echo yeah. through your culture and echo through the your north star i think you can if the money is not active I sure think. Like so yeah that's um, like saying i got an lp who absolutely i've got an investor who loves uh motorcycles yeah, like, doesn't like mean I, every doesn't everyone doesn't have to buy a motorcycle we we have a credit line through American Express, and I don't care what the American Express leadership says, and it doesn't echo through our. Oh, company. you should, you should. There, it's so much fun. Have you listened to their blog? Listen to their blog. That is <laughs> this week on American Express. We're selling you a version of the world that does not exist. That's right. A, um, I would. I think I think you're you're on to something there that. People do need to vote, invest emotionally. And I think that's where um, this, is, this is meant to uh, correct uh, the view of the VC out there, but not to, I might be over exaggerating my point. Okay. And the idea that, you know, VCs also don't know what's going on. They read the same headlines in the Wall Street Journal that everybody else does. And there's no, there's a very few, I've only met one or two 
like grown up venture capitalist who make their decisions with a clear head and understand the totality of what's going on in a self-aware way, what they're thinking about, do they know that they're being pitched or sold to or not? And the vast majority of VCs therefore um, want to be pitched and emotionally sold to. And you cross that million dollar threshold. Great. I just want to, I want to feel in my bones that you're a company that I can invest in. And Mm -hmm. That leads it to the the only reason that they would invest is if they know that they're they feel in their bones, not know. They feel in their bones that this is going to be a billion dollar opportunity yeah. for them. And they feel scared that they're going to miss out. And they have an obligation to their LPs to make good bets. And this is one of them. Mm-hmm. And and when we come up, when you come along as a founder, the way you help the VC get that feeling is you have to be, you know. Uh, emotionally uh, dissident from them. I like. I, I think in a pitch that earlier this week with a, a firm I really respected, I let them know that I really respected them and I wanted them to lead and I I wanted all these things because um, I liked them. I liked them personally. I liked their people. Yep, I knew yep. some, and that was a fatal mistake. Fatal mistake. Yeah. Like VCs liking you. Like I said, this could overstate it. Uh, could could be, you know, a rock in your shoe as you're trying to figure out if you can run with them. It's just going to be like, yeah. Every company I look at has been about. Do I think they can build a, a company, right? And mm-hmm. do I feel like the entrepreneur can make it happen? And the way that the entrepreneur makes it happen is always constantly either has some key insight that no one else understands. And I know it'd be very, very difficult for that entrepreneur's insight to be replicated by someone, not an industry insider, or they just have an amazing track record and the, they keep performing over and over and over again, doing what they say they're going to do. I just, I just think that like, you know, it's just one of those things, like you said, uh, but as the founder, in order to pull that out of you, Mm -hmm. right. Um, I was told by my mentor that, uh, I'm too corporate polite. And I said, what's that mean? And said, you got to show passion. And most people are in his case, most of the money he raised, he wasn't afraid to cuss in the meetings. Cause when he got passionate about something, he uses his whole language. Mm-hmm. So for me to show up and say, we have to make the claims that we are the best because we are. We're the fastest growing company in the fastest growing segment of cybersecurity. Full stop. Right? If you don't believe us, fuck off. Right? Like mm-hmm. that's the level of mindset where I'm building something. I'm offering a, a one time lifetime subscription to my equity sale right now. And the only reason I'm doing that is because I believe with the capital, we can go even further and faster. So, if you don't believe that, then I don't need to talk to you. Yep. And so, and it's, it's not about being rude. It's, I give you this money and you're going to be, I'm going to give you this equity and you're going to be filthy rich. Full stop. You don't believe me. I don't care. Like, uh, like that's, that's the idea. Like I'm going to work as hard as I can to put forward and present and to show you all 20 components of this company. I believe it's my goal to be transparent and to and to create the narrative and the messaging that takes what we're doing and make gets it into your head properly. That's mm-hmm. my job. That's it. That's part of what I'm doing to sell equity. Uh, but once I put it there, if it doesn't match with what you think, then we're passing. Wrap we're moving on. I'm yep. not. I I can't sell any more than that. I can, and I think like. Um, I think that's the interesting edge where for me personally, it means to level up because I've been hiding this fighting side of it because I thought that venture capital was all about really smart people looking at numbers, trying to figure out a niche, build a thesis. And apparently that is for the analysts and the VCs, these MBAs, but like the GPs want to be sold to. Yeah. And so here you go. My job is to give you all this information to sell you on why we're the best. 
if you don't believe it, okay, I'll get you on the next round. That's fine. Yep. By the way, that's what I've been telling folks uh, who have been passing. Like, I've been pretty straightforward and say, hey, get you on the next round. Yep. Not. You're not. They're not invited back. Yeah, I don't care. I'm cognitively dissident from them too, right? Like the exchange is is just simply, you know, uh, hey, I'm giving you equity. You're going to get certain preferences if you negotiate them. You're going to be along for this ride. Mm-hmm. I get it. I'm not coming to the table with this capital. Uh, but, you know, I even told the team today, like, it's within our marks to hit the end of the year be cash flow positive and figure out our own destiny. If that's always within our reach, our capability at, at hook, does that mean we can go put $2 million into our new overhaul of our UX? Or does that mean that we can be a part of every event and be a gold and platinum sponsor in the industry here, there, here, there? No, that just means that we continue to build a tribe of people who love us. And we do that. We've already we've already put the pace on the treadmill at this point. We just keep the pace going. Yep. Take a deep breath. Don't don't hit pause or stop. Let's just go. Mm-hmm. Now, how they respond to that? I think there's a great sense of relief. Frankly, I think the team wants me back more, and they're asking for more of my time, more of my attention, which is the greatest compliment they can give me. Which is, hey, we would like more of you, Zach. And thank you for going out and trying to raise this money and taking all these bumps for us because the team starts to feel guilty because they think, is there something wrong with me or what I'm doing at the company that's not translating into wild success with the venture raise? Mm-hmm. And then everybody starts feeling guilt and shame through the organization. Yeah. And then that's- they don't, they might not realize it on the surface. Like, man, why do I feel so down about hook? Right. Like, oh, maybe it's because I feel guilty that we haven't done X amount of revenues so that we can go get more money. And it's just toxic. So. Yeah, um, we're going to push past all that. So odds are we're going to just try to do an inside round, find somebody to help us. Um, But if worst case scenario, we'll manage through this and we'll get to the next level. It's the, the, the thing is that the momentum is so solid. Oh, you know what? So, so you talk to an. Um, I want to switch gears to um, when you're thinking strategically about growing a company. Um, you talk to a VC or you talk to a mentor who said you have to decide if you are going to help other people be successful or if you're going to be successful. And one of them was going to be a ten million dollar company. One was going to be a billion dollar company. I think this was when you mm. went to that that group up in Colorado or Denver. Yeah. yeah Can you talk a little bit about um, you know, what did that mean to you when you're like, yeah. okay, ha- because because hook going forward, your company, our company, it's uh, you know, we're we're selling to two. Di- we have two different value props selling to two different customers. One is the channel. And the other is the end user that the channel supports. And your gentleman said that, you know, you need to pick a horse. So first off, do you believe him? Second off, what what was going on in your head when you had that conversation? Um, Yeah. So this was as part of a group I joined called True Space, where they track, you know, thousands of successful companies and benchmark them on a... um, really five areas of competencies, but, uh, and then you take the same surveys and do the same work and you see where you match up against these companies, right? In the aggregated whole. And so uh, clarity around why you exist is part of your focus and your, yeah, it's part of your focus in one of the competencies on alignment. And long story short, um, you know, it kind of dawned on us that, or dawned on me that we need to process out uh, whether or not we are here to enable people to train other people, or we ourselves are the trainers that go and train people. Mm. And right now we're both. And what that does 
is it, it just stretches our resources and our focus. And it's not really a focus. It's like trying to see two different things at once at all times. So you're constantly moving your head. Over here in this corner, I'm trying to work with MSPs and partners and uh, training teams to set them up so they can go be heroes. Cool. And then in this side over here, if people don't want to be the heroes, they can pay us to be the heroes. And we, and we become the heroes. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's possibly a way to reconcile those two, but the, um, the game that I started playing in my head was what does it look like to focus on one or the other? And the, the gentleman I was talking to out in Denver about this uh, said, you know, if you go enable other people to be the heroes, it's infinitely scalable like $100 million business, you know, type thing. If you have to go be the hero, there's only one of you, one of your companies, one of your mindsets. Um, odds are that's a $10 million business, right? As shorthand, right? Just like it's one-tenth the scale of whatever it is. So it could still be like a very great business where we're doing 10, 20, $30 million a year being an yeah. expert in the space. Yeah. But, uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunity for someone along that comes along and enables other people to go be the hero. You just made me think of thing, the why. Why are we building hook security? It could be that we want outsized returns for investors. It could be that we want our founders and our employees to all become millionaires, Right. Uh, it could be that we want to have the e our egos are saying we want to build a billion dollar company and this is a market to do it. And the more I'm sitting here listening to us talk, which is delightful, um, I keep thinking, you know, really what I want Hook to be is an engine that supports real change, that creates real safety, that does something actually important. Because... You know, we've seen a lot of folks in our industry who are building profitable, fast growing companies that do nothing but check a compliance box. They don't do anything to actually make an organization better. They don't do anything to actually create a safer world. Um, and maybe that's too strong. There is some benefit, right? But at the end of the day, really, it's not enough. You know, no one's innovating. And no one wants to pay for the innovation because everyone's already making money, right? That's the that's the bad part is that the industry that, that we've picked is growing so fast. You know, it's almost like we need to pick one or two directions. Maybe we don't need to pick, and I'm, this is a this is a um, a fool's choice. I'm I'm about to say, but I think I could be really really proud if five years from now we had a fairly moderately successful company and hit a lot of the goals that we wanted, but it didn't hit a billion dollars, but it was responsible for being the catalyst that changed the entire industry and made the world a safer place. Um, you know, you said your, your, your true North, your, your star that you are focused on. The more I'm getting, you know, sitting in front of venture capital folks in funders and i say but it matters where kids are getting manipulated online and getting kidnapped and we got to do better capitalism's causing the problem with the social media capitalism needs to solve the problem and nobody seems to be moved by that mm -hmm. because what they oh, yeah i mean that just it makes it, me just like screw it let's go find people who that makes their heart sing this and work, work with them. Yeah. I might use different language to describe the same thing. Um, I, I might call it cronyism. Uh, doesn't want to move, right? The, cronyism. The, yeah. The, the, the big tech capital allocators uh, are all have created a world in which they can cycle through each other and continue to print money. Yeah. Um, and so capitalism would, ultimately allow so cronyism is the issue that rises with corrupt capitalism 
that doesn't allow other people to have, you know, access to certain types of means or opportunities. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, I, I would, uh, that's me being a purist. The, but when we talk about what we're like passionate about, if, if you feel like you're up against cronyism, I think you're right. I, what I, the coming out of this week, I started reading a lot more about Elon Musk story, right? Whatever you think about him. Mm -hmm. And when Tesla was about to go bankrupt, there were really were some dark days at Tesla. And he had to continue to evolve his pitch mm. because when you talk about energy independence and functional changes against climate change, and you're saying the way that I incrementally build this is batteries, then computers as cars, and then this, and then that, and then this, and then that, and here we have this better power grid, and now we've updated this for traffic patterns with tunnel, like we're doing all this stuff. And uh, venture capital punished Elon. Oh, yeah. Punished him. They, there is some super ridiculous ridicule about the PayPal mafia and how he didn't know anything coming out of PayPal and what have you. And then the world, once he was able to find a few people who believed in his vision, bailed him out, kept the factory running. I think they were within like 24, 48 hours of shutting down the factories. Mm. Uh, you know, and he had to really fight hard and put on a fire sale to make sure things happened and set in the right motion. Um, and I don't know how he did it. I think that's part of the magic. But then the people who had, you know, the right kind of options calls on Tesla, the stock flipped. Now it's the most profitable car company in human history. Um, that doesn't suck, right? No, but that's because all of a sudden the world started believing what he was saying could be true. Right. And also, he went, he, he went from a mad scientist to now like on saturday night live and now yeah. he owns twitter like it's he couldn't have bought twitter if he didn't have the leverage of tesla behind him and so right. like the world really spent and he i think what he's realized is he has to be incredibly callous to that world and his only job is to put the vision of the company in your head but he can't convince you that's a worthwhile thing to be an interplanetary species, or he can't convince you that energy independence is correct. He can just put the vision in your head. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's 5% of people out there who will believe it. And that's all you need at the right time to carry you through. So when you talk about these things, I, I think about Musk, even though he's, he's culturally in vogue right now, I kind of wish he wasn't. Um, oh, give, make, give them a couple years. Yeah, get well, because if we have the same vision about eradicating online manipulation so that humans can interact with technology in a better, more true and real way, like I think, like that's a that's a world I want my kids to grow up in, right and the like so 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 we have an opportunity coming up where we're gonna be able to put something in front of you know holly branson right um one of the things that you got was hey go and find an investor who impressed all the other investors and so we're like okay let's go what you just said made me think that there's not a market for what you just described because there's a blending of I want to protect children, I want to create this. That sounds like a nonprofit kind of thing. And then you've got corporate education, which is a for-profit kind of thing. And we're not corporate education. It's just how we're making our money. And we're funding this other stuff, which is how do you actually create the sciences? But where we fall down is with investors who can only see the stuff we're doing now and can't understand or will not take a risk on the idea that we could make the world a better place. So if you go back to, you know, Musk, 
the investors who passed were the investors could who did not believe that he could make the world a better place, that he can't make that vision happen. Um, I'm intensely curious on whether or not it was him that was convincing, or did he find crazy investors who, you know? No, so so actually. Because by the way, you're you're going to be pitching Holly in about two to three weeks. So you you bring up an interesting nuance. Um, Don't I? Don't I? That Musk, I believe Musk had at that couple of these um, critical moments, inflection points. Uh, He had a senior engineering team Mm -hmm. that was some of the smartest people ever gathered since NASA put somebody on the moon. Right. And he had the ability to bring, really, it comes down to uh, four or five uh, folks into a room. Right. And he, when investors pull back the layer to the onion, he said, You don't have to believe me, but there is nobody in this world more capable of solving this problem than these five people together. Mm hmm. And yep. if you if you don't believe that, then we're not even close. Like, if you don't believe in their experience, their pedagogy, their uh, point of view on the world, their critical research at this point, up to this point, we um, can leave. And so I think that was really instrumental. That it was not about Elon. It was Elon's superpower was framing questions, working eighty hours a week. And being able to assemble uh, a set of Avengers that had never been seen to solve a problem. And um, interesting, th- there is there is a level that I've also been thinking about the last few days because all the all the major incumbents, billion dollar companies in this in our space in particular, but including Elon and others that I've looked at. Um, all came to the table with uh, an amount of funds that they could provide themselves or amount of financial stability that they had already accumulated. So um, Elon wasn't working on the project in order to keep paying his mortgage. He was working on these larger passion projects. Same with like Bezos at Amazon. So he's just notoriously cheap at the beginning, but he had, he made a perfectly reasonable and great salary and compensation plan being an, you know, yeah, uh, an investment banker or what was he? Uh, he might've been just a private equity guy before Amazon, but like the idea that like these guys were on the razor's edge is not true. Um, and so they had the mental clarity to be able to build that team and to take those steps. And so I do think one of the interesting things about Hook Security is, you know, um, I, I, I showed up after running a nonprofit for seven years. Like there, there's not margin and I hadn't had a previous exit big enough to set us out to have yeah. us go forward. And there wasn't infinite amount of capital. Like even in our space, uh, the largest competitor was, you know, uh, founded by proceeds from another st- exit of another cybersecurity company software company right. and so uh, i wonder how much that helps when setting out these big visions that you can talk to a hundred investors and find the five with the right amount of urgency and mental clarity it's almost like that should be how the um conversation should start is hey guys our numbers are where they are but we've talked to many many vcs at this point and what we know is that if you don't see what we see we're gonna waste a lot of each other's time so why don't we agree on first the numbers are going where they need to go the market's where it's where it's at and even if we just stay in the game we hit these goals and our big vision is this now should we keep talking? Right. Because I think we get on a, a call with a, in sales, we call it spilling your candy. 
right? Hey, why don't you go ahead and, uh, hey, welcome welcome into the building, salesperson. And then before you even leave the lobby, you're talking about um, product features and how great you are. And it's spilling your candy everywhere. And we haven't even listened yet. And we haven't even decided. You haven't done that first part, which is the bonding and rapport. And I used to think bonding and rapport was let's go get drunk. But bonding and rapport is trying to discover if there's a match between what's going on with them and what's going on with you. And it's really hard to do bonding and rapport because especially with venture funds or complex sales inside of enterprise, because there's so many decision makers and the people you start talking to often don't have power. They only have pain. They have no budget, right? Like I'm responsible for finding the unicorns. Can you invest in them? No, I cannot. <laughs> Great. So you know that so spilling your candy maybe maybe there's an authoritative stance we can take at the beginning of all these calls that is look all our numbers are doing everything the industry needs we're, we're crushing it we're growing we're the fastest growing company we have insights that no one else has and we're going to do things that no one else is doing but if you can't get on board with the fact that it might be difficult for you to envision this and then your and your way is out um, then we could probably, we don't need to use the rest of this hour. So I think, yes, I think that is where I'm moving to is how to have that conversation, but it's also mm -hmm. the, who you're having that conversation with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there was somebody last night that was introduced to us, right. From, it was actually from a fund who was passing on us because we were a little too early for them. Mm -hmm. One of those funds that starts at like 5 million, but they, uh, uh, they, introduced us to this this young gentleman at, who is a you know a vp analyst uh sometimes they just call him investor at the vc and i said hey um here's our deck and if this if this is something you're interested in uh unfortunately we we're moving fast and the round is evolving so we're only i'm only taking calls with uh, general partners at this moment and guess what he did he goes, hey, here's the schedule for the general partner if you and I can jump on this call. That's it, bro. And so now I get to have that, that you just told me what the conversation needs to be. Now I can figure out the who, who it needs to be with, at, with inside the firm. Because that I can have that conversation so to clear it with a analyst VC, somebody who does biz dev for a fund. I'm only taking calls with general partners. Hey, we're we're running out of time here. I want you to do the thing you just did, and then. Uh, uh, by the way, I think talking about TSOP, <clears throat> talking about TSOP, I want to have a TSOP party Q1 next year, and I want to end this season when Hook gets their final, whatever, like when when you're back in the company doing the thing. Uh, I want to have a hard stop on this season so we can say here was the journey from here to here. And now we're opening another thing. So I think we probably have about two more episodes hmm. before we're going to close the season out. Um, how do you, how, how do you think things have changed since we started recording these things? Man, I, I, I feel like that should be the question for the, season finale all right that's fine you don't have a good answer that's what you're saying fine <laughs> I, yeah i think I that think... no no let's do that we'll, we'll, we'll for season finale will be hey let's take a look back right take a look back and you know you can listen to the crappy audio that was our first few episodes that's right and uh no well, the only thing that uh that's really changed adam is now people can understand us and they're no longer impressed, but they really <laughs> thought when they couldn't really understand everything we were saying, they're like, but they sound like they might know what they're talking about. That's right. No, that, I think that sounds great. Let's, uh, let's have a few more of these. Let's uh, uh, declare victory on season one and uh, mm -hmm. in Q1 2023, let's, let's ramp this thing back up and let's talk about season two. That'd yeah. Awesome. Um, I want to do next one live down at IT Nation. We're going to be in Orlando. Ah, yeah. So right. if if we can do that, that'd be fun. We'll see. Let's not get distracted. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> hey, you're you're a delightful human being. Well done. 
uh, way to stay in the game. I'm impressed with your ability to reframe constantly. Um, yeah, go team. Listen, I and I appreciate the the sounding board and the fact that you ride the roller coaster and don't seem to get sick. Hey, and thanks for joining us for the TSOB podcast. Find us on LinkedIn and give us your hot take. The whole reason we're doing this is to get access to better conversations that help us up our game. And if you have something you want to share, we want to hear about it. Find us on the TSOB LinkedIn group and jump in with two feet. We can't wait to chat.